He's a lily in the valley, oh, bright as a morning star. chapter number 20 and I'm going to read verses 9 through 12 say amen when you find it amen Acts all the apostles chapter number 20 I start reading at verse number nine. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loaf and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken, broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till the break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and that was not a little comfort. I mean, what I want to talk about today, uh, I don't want to put anybody to sleep, but I want to talk about sleeping. Amen. Uh, uh, falling asleep. Falling asleep on the job. Amen. As many times when we read God's word, we need to know a little bit of background to really get a full understanding. So I want to paint a full picture for us of what was really taking place back then. Paul was on his second missionary journey. He was motivated by a dream uh, which he saw a man of Macedonia saying, come over and help us, according to Acts 16, 8 through 11. And being obedient to his vision, Paul traveled to Troas, a city named after the ancient city of Troy. It was on the coast of Mysia, in the northwestern part of Asia Manor. It was Paul's first trip there, but it wouldn't be his last. We know on a subsequent journey, he left his cloak and a list of books Amen, there according to 2 Corinthians 2 and 12. So Macedonia needed help converting those in Asia Manor to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul went at great risk to his own life. Several men went ahead of Paul while Paul took a roundabout route to avoid going through Syria, where the Jews lie and wait for him. 
they were going to ambush Paul, so Paul had to go around, take a long way around. And he was really putting his own life in great danger by doing so. Even today's missionaries, uh, they live at great risk. And a lot of them are being imprisoned, maimed, and murdered for their attempt to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul, he was not only a passionate preacher, he was courageous and brave. Amen. Paul was a brave preacher, and he was eager to reach as many souls as he could in his lifetime. When Paul got to Troas, he agreed to spend seven days preaching to unbelievers. Yes, sir. And at this writing, six days had already passed. Yes. And most of us probably don't know anything about a seven-day revival. Hmm. Some of us do. I know did my uh, Dickon John and Sister Mary knows. Amen. In the South, we used to have revivals that lasted all week. Yes. And if you was one to be converted, you had to attend service twice a day. All right. For the full week. I believe they had a 12 noon service. All right. You had to be there then and you had to be back for the evening service. Mm -hmm. And this went on for seven days. Amen. And you're supposed to get off, get, get saved. And I never did get saved. <laughs> Amen. Seven days. I endured that Friday night. Oh, I can breathe now. It's all over. Got up Saturday morning and I looked up. Here come the preacher. Amen. <laughs> they want to preach to me again. I remember. Going back down there, the same preacher, he says, what I told him, his name was Gregory, I believe. He said he told me if I didn't get saved, I was going to hell. And I told him, well, I'm going to be among a lot of friends. <laughs> Amen. I, it sounded like something I would say, but I don't remember telling him that. So he asked me at that time, had I got saved yet? I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, at least you're honest about it. <laughs> That's the last time I remember seeing him. Amen. But somehow, I found out later that it didn't take, amen, seven days to get saved. Amen. Amen. But anyway, Paul preached for six days, and here it was now, Sunday morning. And if you remember like I do, Sunday morning was the best time of the week. All right. Amen. You got to sleep a little late on Sunday morning. Yes. You got to sleep until 6 a.m. Yes. Amen. And when you woke up, you woke up to the smell of the aroma of good chicken. All right. Coming out of the kitchen. We ate good young pullets, roast chicken, uh, fried chicken for breakfast. Yes. And you can smell a good, amen, pan of those good biscuits cooking. And if you were lucky enough to have a radio in the house, the whole house radiated with good gospel music. Yes. Amen. People would turn it up loud. We listened to the Reverend Joe Mays. Yes, sir. Amen. The Five Blind Boys. All right. Amen. The Staple Singers. <laughs> Uh, maybe the mighty claws of joy. Yes, sir. The Southern Christian Hills and, yes. and, and you name it, amen. That was old man Franklin would get on there sometime and sing. Yes, sir. Amen. Sunday morning was, was happy time. And you didn't have to be in church till about 10. You were up a long time. Amen. Then you had got a chance to put on your best clothes. Put on my Sunday suit. Amen. Amen. A white shirt. New hat and go to church. Amen. I felt blessed. Yes, sir. And I was. So here it was, I'm sure, that Sunday morning, 
These people come ready. It was their last chance, the last chance for Paul, together with his disciples and followers, to break bread and to preach his last sermon on the trip. And if you were in Troas, as it was, the last chance, if it was the last chance for you to hear one of the greatest preachers to ever preach the gospel. I'm sure you will want to be there too. Yes, sir. Hey, amen. But seven days, I don't think we could deal with that. Hey, amen. Two or three days, maybe today we might put up two days or so with church revivals. And many churches has eliminated revival altogether. Amen. People are not going to show up no matter who the preacher is. <laughs> not for uh, how good he preached for seven days. Amen. I bet if I would get up here and got people to believe me, if I told you I was going to preach till midnight, that's what Paul preached till midnight from Sunday morning. And he preached until midnight. Yes. If I said I was going to preach till midnight, some people probably get up and start leaving. Well, I gotta go home and turn off my slow cooker. I gotta go give my heart my medicine, my medicine. I gotta do this. And they might come back about 11.40 p.m. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> if at all. Yes. Amen, if I could talk to Paul today, I would like to ask him, how did you keep the people awake for that long? Yes. Paul must have been some kind of preacher. Mm -hmm. Amen. He must have been a good preacher to keep the people there all day long from Sunday morning to midnight. Mm -hmm. Amen. How did he do it? Amen. Others, sometimes if I said, I might take a long nap, I might fall asleep, but that would be a long time to even sleep, wouldn't it? Amen. I don't think he could sleep from now until midnight. Amen. But Paul somehow kept the people attention. Now, we don't know much about this young man, Eutychus. But we do know he remained recorded in Scripture as a young man who fell asleep on the job. And he slipped and fell from a third floor window. Now, that's not exactly the, the legacy many of us would want to leave behind. He was there to worship with his fellow converts. Yes, sir. But he fell asleep on the job. All right. He was there to learn and to grow, but he fell asleep. Yes, sir. He was there to witness and convert sinners in the midst to Christ, but he fell asleep on the job. Yes, sir. We are here today for the same reason. We come to worship the Lord. Yes. We come to learn and to grow. We come to witness to somebody who might not know what Christ has to offer for sinners. Yes, sir. And if we forsake assembling ourselves together, we forsake assembling ourselves together, how can we be witnesses for Christ? We might witness, but we'll be ineffective. Now here we are gathered in, in, in this room for maybe an hour or two. And we came to worship our Creator. Yes, sir. Amen. We came to learn and we came to witness. And many times we fall mentally asleep if you're not careful. Yeah. Amen. Sometimes during the service you might wind up trying to balance your checkbook. You are mentally asleep. Now the Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yes. Some people can make excuses and say, I want to worship, but the kids won't be quiet. I want to grow, but I was up late last night and my eyes are heavy, so I'm a little sleepy today. Yes. Now, these are just excuses to cover up the fact that we may have simply lost our passion for our purpose. But don't worry. There was hope for Eutychus and there's hope for us today. Yes, sir. 
Paul restored this young man to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And the Holy Spirit can do the same thing for us today. And we can begin by looking more closely at the duties of every believer. We all have a duty. Yes. And our first duty is to worship the Lord. Notice that's the duty that every believer has. Notice now I didn't say attend worship, but to worship. We're not coming in here like we're trying to rack up some points for our prize. Our first duty is to love the Lord with all our hearts, our souls, and mind. That's worship. Yes, when you love God that much, you'll show up. You won't sit home. You'll show up when you love God with all your soul, your mind, and your heart. Amen. But together with the assembly of the saints who share the love of Christ, we won't miss that opportunity. Now the summons, he describes the act of perfect worship. He said, oh, come let us worship and bow down. Yes. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He is our God. And the pe we are the people of his pastor. Yes and the sheep of his hand, according to Psalm 95, 6 through 7. But the psalmist also described the motivation for worship. He says, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee, Psalm 63 and 3. And I will worship and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Psalm 138 and 2. When we think about worship, yes. worship really is a celebration. Yes, sir. It's a celebration of God's everlasting love. Amen. The psalmist says, praise him up on the instruments. Yes. Praise him up on the string instrument. Mm. Praise him up on the cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise you the Lord. Yes. Praise you the Lord. Yes, sir. And it is a celebration. There's nothing wrong. Amen. We're getting a little lively during a celebration. All right. Some people say it don't take all of that. No, it doesn't take that to get saved, but it takes them celebrating to celebrate. Oh, yeah. Amen. We celebrate his everlasting love, his abundant mercies, and his sufficient grace. And if we truly come to worship, we came here today. I don't know about you, but I didn't come to receive, but to return. Yes. I didn't come with that outstretched arms. I came with a gift in my hand. Yes. I didn't come looking for a blessing. I came because I'm already blessed. Amen. I didn't come with a petition on my lips, but I came, amen, with a praise on my lips. Yes, sir. Amen. I came, I didn't come with a problem. I didn't come in the door because I had problems. Amen. I didn't come because I had, I'm having trouble. I came with, with Thanksgiving on my mind. Yes, sir. Amen. I didn't come with greedy hands, but I came with a full heart. Yes. That's how you worship God. Yes. Now, Jesus gave us a perfect example how to worship. And it is known as the Lord's Prayer. But in that prayer is the design order for worship. What is the first thing he told us to do? First of all, we have to acknowledge God for who he is. Yes. He's our father. He's all of our fathers. Oh, yeah. Which are in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Oh, yeah. Amen. Me, 
bless his name. Praise his name. Yes, yes. We do that first. Yes. Thy kingdom come. Oh, yeah. Not our kingdom. Yes, yes. But we're looking for his kingdom. Yes, sir. Thy will be done. Yes, on earth. Oh. As it is in heaven. Yes, sir. Not our will. We have to put our will aside. And allow God to execute his will. Yes, yes. And after that, after we express our worship to God, then we can come with our petitions. Yes, yes. Then we can come asking for something. After that, he said, give us this day our daily bread. Yes, yes. But he didn't come in begging and asking God for something at first. Amen. If you praise him first, you're better off. Yes, then you can ask him for your daily bread. And he will supply your daily bread. Oh, yes. He may not put it on the table for you. It may be buffet style. You have to get up and go get it. And sometimes you have to stand in line to get it. It may not, you may not always get to the front of the line. You may have to stand behind the line. Some people have to stand in the unemployment line to get it. Some have stood in the welfare line, but God still supplies. Yes, yes. Sometimes you got to stand in the employment line. Oh, yes. Amen. And trying to find some work to do. So you can go out and buy the bread that God supplies. Oh, yes. Amen. Oh, yes. Amen. God always supplies. Yes, sir. But we have to go get it. And bread may not always be the kind of bread you cook in the oven. You may ask him for transportation. Amen. So you can take your children to school and drop them off and run your errands and maybe even get to work and back. But you're asking for your daily needs. Yes, yes. Amen. Too many times, instead of coming to worship first, we turn the equation around and we put our wants first. And then we turn around and say, God, we thank you for what you're going to do. Oh, yeah. Amen. We never told him that we love him. Yes, sir. We never gave his name the respect that he deserved. Yeah. Amen. And when you do that, you'll be better off. And then we continue on and we ask forgiveness. Forgive us our debts. Yes, sir. Amen. You may look at your bank account and say, I don't worry about all my bills are paid. But we all are in debt to somebody. Oh, yeah. Amen. You may be in debt. You may owe somebody, amen, an expression of gratitude. Somebody you may have overlooked and didn't give the person the respect they deserve. Yes. Amen. And guess what? They have done the same thing to you. It's a hell we forgive our debtors. Yes, sir. Somebody has overlooked you. Somebody has crossed you. Somebody, amen, has treated you wrong. Yes. And if you want them to forgive you, you got to forgive those who come against you. Because our God requires a forgiving heart. Yes. Then we go on. And said, lead us not into temptation. Many times, when God really bless you real good, you have to be careful that you don't let temptation get in the way. You may be tempted to give yourself the glory. Amen. And leave God out of the equation and think you did it all by yourself. I don't care how big your career was. How many degrees you may have on your wall, but God supplied it. You played a part in it, but it was not all about you. Yes, sir. Because without God, we are nothing. Amen. Remember the rich fool who went out and gathered all this crop and had to tear down his barns and build new barns yes, yes. to hold what he had. And the Spirit of God said, You're going to get up out of here tonight. Oh, yeah. Amen. He never got to enjoy anything that he had. Because without God, we are nothing. And I want to say this.
is that I've heard, here heard people say, when praises go up, blessings come down. But what I want to say is worship changes things. When you worship God, things change. Sorrow turns into joy. When you worship, defeats turn into victory. When you worship, obstacles turn into opportunities. And burdens turn into blessings. Amen. We should always raise our hands in gratitude. And give God the praise and the glory. We should always open our mouths in praise. Bend our knees in reverence. And lift up our eyes in adoration. And bow our heads in submission. Yes. And allow the Lord to breathe into our souls humility and mold our minds in love. That's how you know when you're worshiping God. Oh, yeah. Amen. You got to bow your knees sometimes. You got to submit to God sometimes. And you got to recognize him for who he is. Amen. The truth be told, most of us probably had already got saved before we figured out that God is who he said he is. And if you hadn't figured it out yet, sooner or later, you're going to realize that God is God. And he's God all by himself. We don't have anything to do with it. Amen. But we can't do what the young man in the scripture did. Amen. He fell asleep on the job. Now, our second duty is to learn and to grow. Too many of us miss too much by not staying alert and awake. If we don't pay attention, how can we learn about the peace that surpasses all understanding? If we don't pay attention, how can we learn about the brother, the, the friend who sticks closer than a brother? Yes, sir. God has an unimagined of secrets to share that will strengthen us when we learn to listen to his word and to submit to his authority. He will teach us how to carry our burdens and to face our trials. He will teach us how to overcome temptations and change our circumstances and keep our commitments. That's why believers should find themselves daily in God's word. God has to minister to us before we can minister to others. He has to teach us before we can teach others. He has to strengthen us before we can strengthen others. You can't do it. Unless you allow God to work on you first. Yes. If God has never encouraged you, how are you going to encourage somebody else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. And another way we learn, we also learn from life experiences and the application of God's word. Sometimes you got to experience some things in order to grow. Amen. Noah learned to follow God's instruction during the flood. Yes. Moses learned God's law on Mount Sinai. Yes, sir. Paul learned the power of the Holy Spirit in a prison cell. Yes. Amen. The three Hebrew boys met the Son of God in a fiery furnace. Yes, David, I mean Daniel, learned to trust God in a lion's den. Oh, yeah. Amen. El Elisha learned to patiently live in the shadow of Elijah. Stephen learned to lean on God even unto death. Yes, yes. The power of the Holy Ghost is what does it. Yes. And sometimes you got to experience things in life before you really realize how powerful God really is. 
See, it's one thing to read a thing. It's another to experience it. You don't learn to become a good driver by just reading the book. Yes. Hey Amen. You got to get involved. Oh, yeah. You got to engage. You don't learn to truly worship just by listening and reading. Yes, sir. You got to put it to practice. Yes. God says, He sent His Son. He, Jesus said, He sent us. Amen. He didn't set us just to always sit on our dusters. He put us here for a purpose. Amen. You'll be prepared right now to be a great ambassador for Christ. You're learning not just through the word of God, but you're learning through your own life experience that God is God. Anybody ever been in a situation when you found out who God really was? Amen. Maybe before you thought you knew. But God can put you in a situation that you got to give him the praise. Amen. Amen. Eutychus, when he fell asleep on the job, he became weary of listening to Paul preach. And our text said in verse 9 that Paul was long-winded. The, power, the, the, the verse say, Paul was long preaching. He was not a 20 minute preacher. Paul was long winded. And the young man fell asleep and fell down from the third floor window as he slumbered in his sleep. And we, he, he fell to a death and we know that he died because the word said he was taken up dead. And that expression means that his body was moved. They probably took it indoor. And thank God Paul stopped preaching long enough to fall on him and to embrace him with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Paul went back upstairs to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Not only was Paul, a long-winded preacher. Paul was a long-winded talker. And they said, the scriptures say, when Paul went back upstairs, he talked a long while, even until the break of day. That means he preached until midnight. And then he spent the rest of the night talking until the break of day before he departed. I don't know about you, but I call that long winded. Yeah. Amen. And then the scripture said he brought Eutychus alive. And it was not a little comfort. To Amen. There was a wave of awesome joy through the crowd that got this man who died on that night was still alive. Because the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit breathed the life back in him. Yes. And if the Holy Spirit can breathe life into a dead body, yes. surely he can breathe it into, amen, a lost soul. Yes. The Holy Ghost can restore you. Yes. The Holy Ghost can quicken you. The Holy Ghost can take you out of a sleeping state. Amen. It can take you out of your slumber. It takes the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can revive our testimonies, breathe new life into our hearts. Yes. And then we will bear witness. He will bear witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. According to Romans 8, 16, right. we are somebody. Yes, sir. We are the creator's children. Don't let that, never let anybody short you and make you feel down. Try to put you beneath them. God didn't create junk. Yes. When God created man and woman, he created something. 
And he gave us a free will. Yes. Amen. Now, isn't that just like God? Yes. And sometimes we let others try to discourage you. That's nothing but, but the devil himself. And the devil is going to be on the job 24-7. Yes. But you don't have to listen to his junk. Just keep your eyes on the prize. Yes. And once you know who you are, Nothing can change that. The scriptures say in Romans, what can separate you from the love of God? Yes. Nothing. Yes. Not even famine. Not even death. Yes. Nothing. There's nothing anybody can do that can stop God from loving you. They can talk about you if they want to, but they can't stop God's love. They can't stop God from blessing you. Just keep on praising him because praises and worship changes things. Amen. If you're feeling down and out, need a blessing, Try praising him first. Yes. Give him the respect for who he is. Amen. Let him know that you appreciate that he, he, he created you. Amen. Then you can make your request known. Oh, yes. He wants you to make your request known. Jesus said we have not because we ask not. Yes. Oh, he wants you to ask him. Amen. If, if your kid comes to you and asks you for something, don't you want to be called daddy or mama first? <laughs> don't you think they ought to acknowledge you first? Yes. Don't you think they ought to say thank you? Thank you. Amen. But if they don't do that, it just always got the hand out. Amen. Jesus is not going to always put a fish in your hand. Sometimes you're going to put a hook in your hand. Oh, yeah. Hey, man, you got to go out and get it. Show me somebody in here who, who are blessed today. Show me the one who didn't have to go out and fish. Yes. Hey, man, if somebody gave it to you, raise your hand. If you didn't work for it, mm -hmm. <laughs> raise your hand. Mm -hmm. hey, Amen. Whatever you got, you had to go get it, but God supplied it. Amen. He promised in his words he would supply all of our needs. Amen. I can say today with Paul, when he got old, with Paul that, that not Paul, but uh, once young, but now I'm old. Yes. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Yes, sir. Nor his seed bag and bread. Yes. Amen. Just stay right with God. Share your testimony with everybody you meet. Because you're not only you're not only responsible for sowing the seed of faith. That's your responsibility. It's to sow the seed. The rest of the story is between the sinner and his God. Yes. You can't force it on him. You can give him your testimony. And your best testimony just might be what some lost soul needs to hear. Amen. With that, I close.